see hi the prince is not new to the game. The Stone Mountain, ga, rapper's prolific decade-long career has yielded a steady flow of lyrical mixtapes, high-profile collaborations, and praise from the likes of Beyoncé and Kanye West. But with a bold, conceptual full-length debut album on the way, in a way Prince is just getting started. If his latest singles, Movin' Around featuring Schoolboy Q and New Africa, are any indication, see hi the Prince's upcoming album will be impossible to ignore. While an exact release date for No Dope on Sundays is TBA, Prince's concept of community in action is very clear. The five-time Grammy nominee, All Five as accredited songwriter for Best Rap Song, plans to bring his Midas touch from behind the scenes to the main stage on his long-awaited full-length debut. In this exclusive interview with See Hi the Prince, he speaks the truth behind the Atlanta rap industry, how he empowered West to speak his mind on hits like New Slaves and I Am A God, recalls life on tour with Lil Wayne, and proclaims his love for some rather unexpected musical inspirations. Your new album No Dope on Sunday seems like it's going to explode. Why do you feel it's going to change people's lives? I think No Dope on Sundays is a great topic that's not just me rapping. I really wanted to be able to touch people in certain ways and touch my community in a certain way where we work on ourselves through our music. I think a lot of times when people listen to me, it's a very intimate moment. They might not have a lot of friends around or whatnot but I wanted this concept to also be able to teach something and be able to learn something, and be able to learn from it but also ITD be something where everybody can listen to it at once. So I put a bunch of different vibes, it's gonna reach every genre and every human being from every race, so I'm glad. I'm happy. New Africa is bold, imaginative and fun. If you had to pick which one of the hypotheticals in the lyrics is your favorite the first line imagine if all the actors and athletes would go back and talk to all the ambassadors. You know what I'm saying, it's a lane that I feel like HASNT been tapped into and it's potential HASNT been tapped into. I think there's a lot of things that me and my people are concerned about here, but there you could expedite it other places. Say in Africa where it's free and there's land. You could go back and tell them, hey, this is what we're trying to do, we're gonna donate money, we wanna bring these resources, and I think they'd be very inclined to it. But I also wanted to do it in a fun way where it wasnt too heavy-handed, but also just giving them their imagination. It's not like it's an exodus or something. It's something you can create in your own community. I feel like the Jewish community has a dope community like that, you might go to New York and they have Chinatown, you know what I mean just create that culture where if anyone wants to come get some culture from hip hop or anything, you come to us and we can give you the inside scoop on it. So I think that's what the main reason for that song, and the main direction I was thinking when I made it. Yeah, it's a real thought starter, I always say, you can't tell nobody to cut their grass unless you cut your own. So a lot of times, we have to also understand after we do express our differences and our concerns, how do we go back to the table and rectify them and just not just voice our opinion. That's what I like to do. I say I'm the Navy SEAL of my community. The Army is those that march are those that speak out, but I'm the one who really goes and gets the job done. Where does Atlanta sit as one of rap's capital cities now, compared to when you entered the game almost a decade ago? Well, I think Atlanta has so much culture and you know I would like to say this, it's very touchy but I want to say it. You know, we don't have as many black executives or executives in Atlanta. It's just the executives are probably in New York and California and they'll fly there. So a lot of times we have to make our own executives. A lot of times, that takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of, I would say from my culture, penitentiary chances, you know, where guys are doing anything to come up with this money to be able to fund their studio, to be able to market their project, to be able to do all these things. So a lot of times, people want to know why our city is flourishing because we have the hustle of doing it all ourselves. So when you do it all yourself and you have different individuals you're rubbing shoulders with, and we're all into that, I think it builds up a platform that we can showcase our artists, and then other labels come down and, you know, joint venture deals and different things. So I think in a nutshell, it's just that environment of swag and talking crap and coming up with these songs and having fun. It's just very country but also soulful. I think that's how we keep it all together with all those different things around it that keeps the culture vibing. So, Kanye told you that you owe your career to Beyonce for telling him to sign you, but what do you feel you owe Kanye for the influence he's had on your career my life? I just think him just being able to teach me how to even communicate with the producers and the engineers was so important. Like I didn't know what reverb meant and 808s and 909s and toms, it's just all these things that he knows and I thought most rappers don't know. 
but to be able to show me everything, how to put this album together, how to put these songs together and being able to communicate with the writers and the artists and the producers and the engineers, I just think that education is invaluable, like, I can't put a price tag on that. I just learned so much and I'm still learning every day, so I think he's the greatest. With the five Grammy nominations as a writer for Kanye songs, what do you feel he's learned from you at the end of the day? I think I'm a very out-of-the-box thinker. A lot of people don't know, if you listen to my mixtapes and you listen to his albums, you can tell there's a conversation going on in the studio, and that's what he likes. He likes to come in the room with different people from different walks of life and brainstorm, and that's mostly the album. 80% of his albums are brainstorm. There's only 20% of his actually doing something. Most of it's like, the thoughts, the thoughts, the thoughts. The easy part is executing them, but the hard part is really coming up with what he wants to do. What I like to do is challenge him, like, nah, you can't say new slaves. Yeah, you can say I'm a god. What you mean, you can't say that oh, you, what you wanna say, I'm a gangster when he said that, that was a real conversation. What you a criminal, what you a and like, what is it oh, you want to think of yourself to be the highest being, you shoot for the moon and fall among the stars. That is what we were talking about, people were in the room who were Christian and who were other different religions that were rubbed the wrong way and we had to have those conversations, so that is what I think that he got me and therefore, to really cut that ice, you know what I mean, to actually get to the meat of the song and the root of the songs. I think Jesus was the first time you probably heard that influence. What hobbies do you have outside of music? Outside of music, I'm very regular. I'm very go to the movies. I like to fish, I water my plants, I kiss my girl on the forehead, and I write. I write because I told myself if they write another Bible, I want to be in it. If they write a Last Testament, my name has to come across one of them books, so that's why I'm here to write. I don't have any other hobbies but to destroy rappers, that's my biggest hobby. You toured with Lil Wayne earlier this summer. Any crazy memories from that tour we were on different schedules, and I had so much promo to do in between the dates we did and to really get to hang out like we should. But what I learned from him is he performs like it's his first show every show. I've never seen anybody do that. You're Lil Wayne, you can go in there and just swag out, he's in there like, Wayne, it's not that serious. You're Lil Wayne, the ticket's already sold here. But it doesn't matter if it's a small venue of 20 people to a million people, he gives a show, man. I was impressed, and his voice still sounds immaculate. Like man, this guy's incredible. He doesn't get old. That's what I learned from him, the professionalism. He comes on stage and gives it every night. You played football growing up. Who's your NFL team, and what is your pick for Super Bowl 52? You gotta go with Tom Brady and the New England Patriots, unfortunately. But my favorite team is, I'm from Atlanta, I like the Falcons, but I played park ball for a team called the Central DeKalb Cardinals, so I love the Arizona Cardinals. What are three things you're inspired by right now? I love Valerie June, I don't know if you guys ever heard of her, she's a country singer. She probably thinks I'm obsessed with her because, I mention her every time somebody asks me, I just love her music. I've been listening to a lot of 60s music, I've been trying to go into that lane. And I, love Fela Kuti. I could just listen to his music all day and just work and write raps. Those are my three inspirations right now. Traditionally, West Coast hip-hop encompasses MCs hailing from the state of California. However, Portland, or dot bread rapper Minet has always drawn outside the lines. A fan of everyone from Kanye West and Andre 3000 to John Mayer and Prince, Minet's music sounds like his videos look crisp, bright and honest, with a splash of humor. The 23-year-old recently released his debut album, Good For You, a collection of songs he originally made for his own enjoyment. Now the world is taking notice following a breakout performance on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, and a high-profile endorsement in the form of an Instagram roller skate montage from the one and only Beyoncé. Amina came by our headquarters in Santa Monica last week to talk about his new album, The Real Portland, his love for acting, TV shows, The Color Yellow, and more. Good for you dropped just a couple weeks ago. How has your daily life changed since your debut album was released? It changed my life in the way that I'm just really happy it's out because I really worked hard on it. I'm just happy to have people listening to a project of mine. It's kind of like something that is your baby and you're just handing it off to get babysat, and you just want to make sure every babysitter's cool laughs. It's my baby. You said you made Caroline in your room on your laptop, just like 50 other songs. Why do you think this was the one that took off like crazy because it was the only song I put out at the time laughs? Yeah, I really didn't think much of the song. 
I don't really expect much from any songs I put out. I just kind of make them and hope for the best because I'm the kind of guy who likes to hope for the least and then if the best happens, I'm like really happy. Beyonce's IG post featuring Caroline went viral. It's sort of a cosine of sorts, so what did that mean for you? We were freaking out about that, me and my friends. Beyonce is Beyonce, there is no other way of putting it. But when we saw that, we were just like, what it's just really funny, because I'm from Portland and me and my friends are pretty average, so seeing her listening to my song was just like, what you know, there's really no words to explain it. But it was really cool. She's a legend. It was surreal for sure. A post shared by Beyonce at Beyonce on August 5, 2017 at 1004 p.m. PDT Portland is not mentioned often as hip-hop hotbed. What's the scene really like there, and what's it like to claim Portland as home? I love growing up in Portland because I'm not from LA or New York or Chicago or some cool city. It was a very regular suburban life. People don't expect a lot of African Americans to live in Portland, but I lived in a mainly all African American neighborhood. I mean, there's black people everywhere, it was just a very suburban, normal life. I had my first crush. I learned how to ride a bike, things that made me who I am today. The hip-hop scene, there's tons of rappers and artists there. Portland never really had its own original sound, and we're still creating that for ourselves. But it was a lot of indie bands and their WASNT a lot of space for hip-hop so I had to go to New York and LA to get more opportunities, you know. I got more show offers as a nobody in LA and New York than I did in Portland. It should NT be like that, but it was. So it's still developing, it's still a great place. There's a lot of artists like The Last Artful, D.O.D.G.R. and My Capes, a lot of rappers are coming out of there. You've said yellow is the new black and that you rock yellow on some yellow like what purple is to prints. Why yellow it's my favorite color laughs at ISNT really because the moods. I don't know have a deep explanation, it's just one of my favorite colors. I don't know Prince's music like the back of my hand, but I was always a fan of him as an artist, just the way he was a person who did not care about what people thought and did his own thing and I thought that was so cool. Everything I saw that he did was so seamless and it just flowed together, and I saw purple in everything he did. And when he died, I saw the Empire State Building turn purple. Not to jinx myself, knock on wood, but if I die, that would be cool if it was yellow. Actually, they just gave Prince his own purple Pantone color called Love Symbol 2, that's so fire. That's a goal of mine. You just established a new goal for me laughs. Can you tell us how the album cover concept for Good For You originated? I had the newspaper idea for a minute, so I wanted to always incorporate that in the album cover in some sort of way. But with that I wanted to establish or put in the idea of how I am as a person and how my music is. I don't really care how people see me in my natural state, in a comfortable state. That's really what the goal was. It wasn't anything too deep where the toilet has this symbol. It was just a very comfortable place, and I come up with a lot of ideas on the toilet as well. That reminds me of the beginning of the Red Mercedes music video, yeah? If you look closely, I put the newspaper in that video and I was sitting on the toilet, so I just wanted to give a hint to the album cover early on, and it said the album title on there months before the album was announced, but no one really noticed that. I got that idea from when Donald Glover, Childish Gambino put the Awaken, my love cover in Atlanta. I was like, okay, that's amazing. I need to do that. You've named Kanye and Andre 3000 as musical influences. Can you name something you borrowed from each of them I don't know specifically? I can't be like, yeah I took this from this song, but every Kanye album is one of my favorite albums. I don't think there's an album I hate. I didn't really appreciate 808's heartbreak when I was in middle school because I was a kid and didn't really get what singing was at the time because I was such a huge fan of rap. Then 808's and Love Below opened my mind into what being an artist meant, instead of just rapping over beats. It was just super cool. It was basically like indie music to me, it wasnt even hip-hop or RB. I think that's closing those albums in a genre they don't belong in. Those were alternative magic. What about style influences? A lot of Andre and Kanye laughs. I don't tell many people this, but this is funny. I used to do this thing in elementary school where I would have a new outfit and before I'd put it on, I'd close my eyes and imagine what Kanye or Andre would look like in it, and if it didn't look right on them, I would anti wear it. I think I kind of still do that sometimes when I see an outfit that I'm iffy about. I'm like, hmm, would this look good on Kanye or Andre? Nah, okay. What are three things you're loving right now? Game of Thrones, for sure. I was watching an episode last night. It's one of my favorite shows ever. 
it's gotten pretty intense, if anyone's kept up, it's pretty crazy. I was on my couch standing, yelling at my TV during the last episode. Master of None is one of my favorite shows, too. I could just name a bunch of movies and TV. I ate Shake Shack last night. I really like Shake Shack burgers. I like In Out a lot, but Shake Shack is just divine. More exclusive interviews drama on Kendrick Lamar, Cardi B more The World is Ready for Muna. In fact, the world needs them, now more than ever. This trio of talented women, who self-identify as queer, brings fresh energy and perspective to a growing equality movement. Their debut album, appropriately titled About You, has launched the band onto bigger and bigger stages from Lollapalooza to an opening slot on tour with Harry Styles. And they're just getting started. But what sets Muna's infectious synth pop apart is their keen ability to transcend all things political and personal in their songs. Their anthemic single, I Know A Place, was written in reaction to the horrific nightclub shooting in Orlando in June 2016, and echoes with a familiar truth today as our nation copes with the tragic mass shooting in Las Vegas. At the same time, the song also deals with the struggle inside of all of us to love ourselves. Beneath all of this cultural impact and commercial success, Muna comprised three extremely close friends. Their bond was overwhelmingly evident in sitting down with band members Katie Gavin, Naomi McPherson and Gisette Maskin to talk about the music that moves them, their upcoming tour with Styles, how they get along on the road, and more, About You was really four years in the making. What does the album mean to you is a self-produced arrival announcement McPherson it's hard to talk about. We're just excited that it's all finally out because we've been sitting on the songs for so long, and working on them for so long. There are tracks on the record that have had, like, five different Ableton sessions started from scratch and built the song all the way up, and there are other ones that just came together in a day. So, it's just nice to have them out for people to be able to listen to and sing at shows and stuff. I know A Place is an anthem in every sense of the word musically as a celebration, but also socially as sharp commentary, specifically on Orlando. What are some of the most memorable reactions you've gotten from fans about the power of this song and this message Gavin one of? The first things that comes to my mind is that we have a fan who had lost a family member in the shooting in Orlando and we got a letter from her at the show that we were playing. It was on our headline tour, and it was probably the only person that I had communicated with directly who had had such a direct connection to the shooting. But, you know, regardless, I think that everybody had a really strong emotional connection, sometimes to be yourself, you put yourself in physical danger. So it's just crazy playing that song almost every time we play it live, especially at headline shows, you see people having cathartic emotional experiences. So, we're just so lucky as a band I find there is a huge depth of deep experiences, like, it's not just a handful, it's like every time we play it, you see somebody, at least one person who is just in it, processing, so that's cool. Opening for Harry Styles this fall, what's the one thing you want as many legions of fans to take away from your opening set mask and that's a really interesting question. We've been thinking about it a lot. It's very confusing laughs. Gavin I think our role is to kind of prime them. I mean, these fans are so passionate and one of the reasons it's so exciting for us to be opening for Harry on this tour is that every single person in those rooms, they're ready for such a huge experience for them. This is a memory that they'll have for their whole lives, so we're kind of just opening the ceremony, just kind of prepping them for almost like a ritual, you know so that's kind of how I see it. McPherson were trying to increase the spirituality of the whole thing. It's our first tour of this magnitude and it's his first tour of this magnitude for obviously completely different reasons. His first show at the Greek is our first show at the Greek, so we're together in that experience, we're completely different, but we're in the same place at the same time having an experience, and it's special for both of us for different, and the same reasons, first night of tour with at Harry. See you later this evening, San Francisco, dance with us pic.twitter.com to ioyf 9 can Muna at Where is a Muna September 19, 2017 Are you nervous about meeting Harry McPherson? I'm just gonna be jealous of his outfits. Maskin, he's a good-looking guy. Yeah, we're excited to meet him. I'm nervous, yes, laughs McPherson. We say crazy stuff to people a lot of the times. Maskin, yeah, I hope we don't offend him, laughs who are some other female or LGBTQ artists that are killing it right now, and what do you love about them? Maskin SZA is a female artist who is just slaying. McPherson, we've been following SZA for years, for a long, long time. It's one of the first things we bonded over. Maskin in college, Naomi made me a mixtape of all SZA stuff. McPherson she sampled Fleetwood Mac, and I just always thought she was so cool, and obviously she's had such an amazing, it seems like a year, but it's been a few months. 
Mask and Perfume Genius, McPherson and New Paramore Album, Gavin the New Big Thief Record, McPherson Big Thief They're Incredible, Marika Hackman is a homie of ours, but her album is amazing, Japanese House, she's incredible, too, you have professed your love for 80s artists, from Michael Jackson to Kate Bush and the Smiths, who are your favorite artists from the 90s, Gavin the Coors, McPherson Portishead, Mask and the Cranberries, Nirvana, Honestly, I love Pearl Jam, I look like Eddie Vedder, I mean, hopefully, laughs McPherson. We take a lot more inspiration from the 90s than people might think. I mean, we like 80s drum sounds and the kind of funk aspect of it, but there's so much. How would you describe Muna's fashion style Gavin? We wear what Naomi tells us to wear. McPherson, that's true. Mask and yeah, Naomi is our stylist, laughs it's confusing. We're like the Spice Girls, we all have different vibes. What does Muna argue about mask and everything McPherson what we're gonna wear? Gavin it's just really normal, quotidian negotiations about what we need, whether it's 10 minutes by myself or some ramen. We're just trying to make the whole thing function. A post shared by Muna at Where is a Muna on September 27, 2017 at 730 MPDT Muna's roots go back to the campus of USC. What is the thing you miss most about school McPherson I'm like a nerd, I liked being in school. I liked going to classes and not having to make choices about what I'm going to do in the days. There was a simplicity to it that was really nice, a structure. Gavin I also think about it in terms of organizing too and like activist communities, it's so much easier when you're on a college campus and it's such an important time for so many people to build up those muscles. And I think about that a lot, how, I mean, especially in Los Angeles it's kind of hard to keep that up. We really isolate from each other when you're just a member of the greater community. So that is something I'm nostalgic for, yeah? Just being passionate and knowing who to call and where to meet to make something happen. I know you're Harry Potter fans, but aside from Harry Potter, what is your favorite film at the moment? Gavin Ms. Congeniality. McPherson Ms. Congeniality, 1 and 2. Mask and Legally Blonde. McPherson It's All the Same Canon. Gavin Do you know what our favorite movie is? Spy, starring Melissa McCarthy. McPherson Spy is great mask and we watched it on the plane again, we were going to London, out of Glasgow. We kept trying to pause it because we couldn't get all on the same time, because on air New Zealand you can screen share, which is great, but it kept getting messed up so we paused the movie five times. McPherson we wanted to all laugh at the same time laughs. Lastly, fill in the blank Muna's favorite place to play on tour is McPherson wherever there is Donka catering, whenever it is not hot. Gavin I love playing in like middle America where people are like, thank you for coming here and they're surprised that you came. McPherson, Kansas City is wild, Mask and Salt Lake City, Utah, wild, Canada is the best. Honestly, we don't really know a place where it's like, uck, don't want to go back there. It's all good, as long as we can find a dank smoothie and some sweet snacks. I love dates. Well be chill anywhere. The long lineage of electric guitar blues masters, from Muddy Waters to Bonnie Raitt, have left very few stones unturned. Yet somehow, Gary Clark Jr. continues to find new ways to push the instrument and the genre forward. His impassioned, unhinged guitar prowess and soulful songs have vaulted him into the upper echelon of next-generation blues troubadours. Fresh off the release of a new live album earlier this year and the tour of a lifetime with Eric Clapton and Jimmy Vaughn this summer, Clark is truly riding high. Von Clark Jr., Clapton Photo Kevin Mazurgetti Images, Gary Clark Jr. Photo Cynthia Edorgetti Images We track down Sonny Boy Slim himself in Los Angeles in advance of his shows with Clapton at the Forum to talk about his love for live albums, touring with his heroes, life as a father, and more. With two blistering studio albums now in your catalog, why was the time right to record and release a live album this year I grew up listening to live albums. Some of my favorite albums are James Brown, Live at the Apollo and Jimmy Reed, Live at Carnegie Hall. It's kind of like I feel like I'm a part of that club. Especially blues and jazz music, I think that it's very important to capture those moments because songs can change and evolve. For me, I love to capture that and I just thought ITD be cool. A lot of my fans are super guitar fans and like to hear me switch it up, so I thought it was the perfect thing to release Live North America 2016. Your playing and singing seem driven by deep-rooted passion and sheer inspiration. When you really let go, what are you drawing upon that puts the power of music in your hands and in your voice? When I'm singing, I'm driven and inspired by things in my life. A song like Our Love could be sung very different depending on my relationship at the time or if I'm having a good day or a bad day, you know. I just put it all out there on the stage and it's freeing, it's liberating, to get that feedback from the audience and know that I'm kind of connected, and they feel the same thing.
It just kind of pushes me to put it all out there. Nobody wants to come see you be Halfa, you know what I mean so, give it all. Little Richard said, give it all or none, so that's what I'm doing. You're in the middle of a run of shows with Eric Clapton and Jimmy Vaughn. What has slow hand meant to you as an inspiration for your music to be touring with Eric Clapton is literally a dream come true. My life having some sort of circular path, I was 12 years old when I started playing guitar. And it seemed like a week or two after that there was a show on TV, Austin City Limits, and I was watching a Stevie Ray Vaughan performance and then that was followed by a tribute to Stevie Ray Vaughan, an incredible guitar player from Texas, and on that tribute it was his brother Jimmy Vaughan, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Bonnie Raitt, Robert Cray and Eric Clapton. And he did this song Ain't Gone and Give Up on Love and just his tone and his singing, his guitar solo, it floored me, so I was like I want to do that one day. Whatever that is, I feel like I need to be a part of that. I WASNT the best athlete, WASNT the best student or whatever, but this was something, I was like, I want to connect with that. So to be here 20 years later, and be playing these massive venues with Clapton, is very validating for me. I feel proud and I'm honored. It's one of those things if you put your mind to something you can accomplish it. It's made me feel more confident in my decisions despite the pushback I've gotten from people, you know, are you sure you're gonna take that path, yeah when I'm singing, I'm driven and inspired by things in my life. I just put it all out there on the stage and it's freeing. What's it like trading looks with Clapton and Jimmy Vaughn any surprises man, to be up there on stage with Jimmy Vaughn and Eric Clapton, going back and forth, sharing solos, it's amazing. It's also intimidating. I'm not as smooth or disciplined as a guitar player so I kind of gotta watch myself and not get a little bit too excited. It's funny, the first night I sat in with them on the encore I had my reverb all the way up and clapped and goes, man, you're like the king of reverb, and I was like, that's not a compliment laughs. So I was like, noted. So it's fun and educating. The other night we were up on stage and I walked out and there was a major surprise. You know I've got a signature guitar, an Epiphone Casino, and I walk out and Eric's playing this guitar that I gave him a while back, and it was just kind of, it kind of got me a little bit. I was like, wow, you've jammed with many legends, but who would be the one musician you'd want to share the stage with, living or dead, and why I got an invite to go to Paisley Park, and I did and end up making it, and that hurts a little bit. I absolutely love Prince, and I think that would have been amazing, just to be able to sit and talk and converse about music and you know, maybe somehow it would rub off. Yeah, that's the big one. I think about that every day. Your recent Come Together cover gives the Beatles classic a nice thick coat of grit. What was the inspiration for that treatment of the song The Approach for the Beatles Come Together track was basically a great artist, Junkie XL. That was basically his blueprint, his foundation. He was already working on the track and had this industrial, powerful, futuristic vibe, and he came in and was like, you know that fuzzy stuff that you do, let's do that. And it came together, I was thinking about that pun before I said it, it was too late laughs. I gotta give it up to him. He's super creative and he let me do my thing and guided me in the perfect way. I think the track is super heavy and it was awesome to work with him, so big up to Junkie XL. Your son, Zion, is too now. How has fatherhood changed you as a man, yeah? My boy Zion is going to be three in January. It's incredible to see this little guy grow up and soak up the world and spit it out in his own way. It's incredible to watch and it's funny I'm just laughing all the time. The stuff that comes out of his mouth, you know. His new thing is, um, okay, maybe, no laughs. I'm like, I want to be upset, but it's awesome, man. He knows what he wants. It's the most amazing thing ever. I could go on and on and on. I love that boy. Over the summer you hit Snoop Dogg with a shout out on Twitter. What do you like to listen to outside? Of the blues genre I love hip hop. Snoop Dogg is one of my favorites, you know, I heard doggy style when I was a kid and I was like, what Dr. Dre, the chronic. I grew up listening to Nirvana. But stuff I listen to now, I like Little Dragon, whatever Beyonce does is fine with me, Kendrick, Courtney Barnett. It's all over the place. I'm all over the place. And I roll around with a bunch of people on a bus and they've got their own influences and so stuff would just kind of seep in. I love it all. I appreciate artists willing to put that forward and give their own take on this stuff. What do you like to do on your day off on tour when I have a day off on tour I like to sleep, man. I like to catch up on some sleep, go hang with the boys, go break bread, just vibe and have some laughs, go see some comedy. I love stand-up comedy. Got any favorite comedians Dave Chappelle? I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan, I like his perspective, his take. You posted a picture of your Lincoln Continental on IG last week. 
what is your dream car? My dream car would fly. So, ITD be like a continental with wings like a transformer, something like that. That would be dope. I want that UFO street stuff.